friendly banter. A friendly banter would be said in this thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Friendly. समझेगा Two people are have joined. You can see that. Should we start? Yeah. Yes, Ashant. Can we start? Okay, you can start. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Masterclass Live session that we are doing for Living My Promise today. Uh, I'm Manisha, and let me introduce my colleague Deepa, uh, co-founder of. Pramiti Philanthropy Partners, and I will be asking her a few questions today that we have received from you about structuring your social capital portfolio. So sit back, enjoy uh, the conversation today, and during the course of conversation, if you want to ask us any of the questions that you may have, please type those in the comment section, and I will try and include those in during the course of conversation. Uh, so before we start, let me speak a little bit about uh, living my promise. So inspired by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, uh, Living by Promise is actually a promise intended for Indians who would want to pledge more than 50% of their wealth uh, to various charitable causes. And the concept is very simple indeed. Um, any Indian who has a wealth of more than one crore uh, can pledge to give 50% or more of his or her wealth to the causes of his or her own choice um, and sign the pledge, uh, which causes, which NGOs, which activities is completely the person's choice. Um, so till date, 41 individuals have signed the pledge. Um, you can read about their journey, why they decided to join the pledge, and more, more information about Living My Promise. You can log on to the web page, uh, livingmypromise.org. Um, so let's start, Deepa. Uh, welcome. And the first and the most important question, why is it even essential to have a structure to your entire giving? Um, thank you, Manisha. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and it's great to note uh, a lot of people have uh, joined this uh, uh, conversation. And congratulations to the Living My uh, Promise effort. I think it's a very commendable effort to have 41 Indians already signed the pledge. Um, now, coming to your question, Manisha, of uh, why do we need a structure in the philanthropy? Um, see, most of us actually give for the joy of it. But uh, what we believe is actually if you have a structure to your philanthropy, uh, it adds further purpose to it. And uh, actually structuring the approach or, uh, to the philanthropy helps you in three ways. A, it uh, helps you, uh, you know, track your uh, giving. 
Uh, second, it actually gives you an opportunity to review in a periodic way, in, you know, maybe once in six months or so, what is going on well, what is not, who would you like to increase your support with, understand the challenges on the ground, and so on and so forth. And third, last but not least, and very importantly, I think it actually allows you to have an active feedback loop of sorts uh, to align perhaps once every couple of years as to what causes that you had initially, uh, you know, kind of decided to give, whether they are still in line with your priorities, because things change all the time. Uh, and the priorities of people also change all the time. So all of this actually helps you reflect on and decide, is this something that you want to continue or make a change? So it helps you uh, plan your future giving in a way. Uh, but I would like to just caveat that, uh, you know, giving should still be a joyful thing. And, um, you know, maybe the structure is not for everybody, but if you want purpose added to it, then definitely uh, you should structure your philanthropy. And honestly, a simple Excel sheet will do all the trick for you. Oh, that's interesting, Deepa. Um, thanks. And um, just for the viewers and listeners, if you have any of the questions, uh, please feel free to type those in the comment section. Um, so going to the next question, Deepa, uh, now that people want to put a structure to their philanthropy, uh, the, naturally, um, the natural question that comes to one's mind is, how many causes is the right number of causes to start with? And how does one really go about selecting this? Right, right. No, that's a very uh, tough question and all, almost always the first uh, hurdle uh, when you start to think about uh, structuring your philanthropy. And, uh, you know, we all know India is a land of many, many needs. However, our time and budget is limited. So what we have seen in our experience is the key thing is to get started with it. Um, and ideally one to two causes that you probably deeply resonate with and uh, you feel you can contribute both your uh, money as well as time to it to actually learn about it is the best way to uh, kind of uh, start it. Um, and how we can do it is something we will, uh, you know, kind of address in the follow on, hopefully in the conversation uh, going ahead. Um, and if you are an emotional giver where you feel that, uh, you know, you want to uh, give to many causes, you get, uh, you know, moved by what you see on the ground every day, then what we suggest is a portfolio approach. And we've seen people do that. Uh, which, you know, one to two of your core causes that you deeply resonate with uh, should be the bulk of where your giving should be. But you could potentially carve out maybe say 10 or 20 percent of uh, your overall giving budget itself to other causes that you feel you would like to contribute towards, say a friend is running a marathon or some a disaster strikes and you would like to contribute towards it. Um, so that's what our uh, suggestion would be. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, so, assuming that one ident wants to identify one or two causes, how does one really go about uh, selecting those causes? Because there are invariably many, many things that appeals to an individual and there is a need for pretty much everything. Uh, so, how does one go about it? Right, right. Um, so, yeah, that's the right follow-on question after you uh, hopefully know that, uh, you know, you should ultimately zero in on one or two uh, causes. So, how does one go about that, right? Um, so what we have seen, uh, you know, when we work with families is, or individuals is when people start giving, it's often shaped by their personal values, experiences or triggers in their life. Uh, for example, uh, you know, people have, you know, we've known people who have selected education as a core cause uh, because they have benefited immensely from scholarships or they've had wonderful role model teachers and hence would like to give back uh, to the cause of education as they believe it had made, it has made a significant difference uh, in their lives. Um, in some other cases, it could be that, um, uh, you know, uh, we have seen where health is a, you know, they are a doctor couple and they believe that malnutrition is the way to go uh, to solve the problem. And hence they have chosen to uh, pick uh, malnutrition as the cause. A uh, few people have also looked at with respect to the whole geographical approach with respect to unit of intervention saying, I would like to contribute locally so that I can give time, I can track how the giving is going. Uh, if you are still stuck, uh, our um, 
the best or maybe one of the start points uh, that you could consider is actually reflecting and trying to answer questions around uh, you know what upsets the most uh, what upsets you the most when you read the papers in the morning or what gives you the greatest joy or what matters most to you what do you believe will bring about a change in the world um, or it could be a proverb or a cliche that you have heard most often and you feel that it's true and hence you know some of those answering some of those questions or reflecting upon that would hopefully give you some uh, some you know framework in terms of what cause do you identify with um, for the rational givers who want to believe in a you know a structured way to think about causes, uh, what we have is actually something that we have evolved is called as a three P model. Um, the three P stand for uh, people, uh, places, as well as um, with respect to the problem that you're trying to address. Uh, when I say people, it could be list of you know where would you like your giving or who would you like to. Uh, let your given address, right, which is in terms of children, women, girls, it could be youths, it could be animals, it could be, uh, you know, transgender, whatever the case may be. Uh, and the second part is the problem, it's the second P, which is within that subgroup that you identified in terms of the beneficiary or the people, what problem would you like to address there? Uh, again, uh, to give you an example, if you have chosen children, it could be education, it could be health, it could sorry, sports, it could be values, so on and so forth. And uh, place is typically, uh, you know, whether you want to address it locally within, say, Bombay, Bangalore, Delhi, uh, within a particular ward, uh, within the city, are you okay statewide, district, state, or even pan India effort? So let's pause there for, yeah, if you have any questions. Absolutely. So assuming that people starting out their journey in philanthropy have now identified one or two causes that they would want to experiment with. The next step naturally is who do, who do I support? Which NGO do I select? Um, so how do you go about doing that? Well, congratulations. You've caused the first hurdle of identifying the cause, hopefully. Um, the second one is actually simple. Once you've figured out what cause you want to give, uh, here I would like to borrow from our legendary Amitabh Bachchan, uh, Khan Banega Karodpati, and say that there are three options to you, and the way you would like to exercise those options is up to you. It could be one at a time or a combination, um, which is 50-50. Um, again, same, ask the uh, experts and actually phone a friend. Um, so in when I say 50-50, it's actually saying, you know, going to Google and actually there are platforms out there such as GuideStar India, Give India, uh, Credibility Alliance, who have done bulk of the work for you actually by uh, identifying organizations that are at least cleared for transparency. Uh, and what I mean by that is actually they have uploaded their financials, they have been in existence for hopefully minimum of three years or so, and you can actually shortlist and select. So once you have that, that could be a potential start point for you. The second one, which is around uh, phone a friend, and trust me, this works more often than not, is typically within your network and peer group, you will find people who have already been giving or been associated with a cause or an NGO and asking them and reaching out to them for uh, help. Uh, would be the ideal thing to do and get a conversation uh, going as to what it is and actually visit the organization together even. Um, the third one, if you're still confused and you would not want to do the hard work, um, you know, we've got fantastic foundations in India, uh, including, uh, you know, and CSRs, large CSRs who have done the bulk of the work for you with respect to diligencing the organization, actually giving them money and monitoring and all of that. Um, so here's what, uh, you know, you could actually fall back on or piggyback on these organizations such as Tata Trust, Azim Premji Philanthropic Initiatives, uh, Edel Give and AT Chandra Foundation, Rohini Nilakini, and there are umpteen number of those uh, if you actually do the search. They have listed those organizations that they support on their website that you could piggyback on. Right. So Deepa, we have a question here. Okay. Um, so uh, Somebody wants to know whether if you have a kitty of five to ten lakhs to begin with, um, is it better to go with a, a portfolio approach that you just talked about, or is it better to just decide on one NGO and uh, experiment with that NGO? Right. Right. Um, 
So honestly, uh, it depends on what your uh, risk appetite is and how would you like to do it. If you're very confident that you know the NGO in question and uh, you can vouch for it, you have started engaging with that organization and have uh, you know good rapport with the founders, believe in the vision, then you should just go with uh, you know five to ten lakhs if that is something. You should go ahead contributing to that organization. But if you're confused about it and don't know where to start with it, uh, the suggestion would be is to actually experiment. Start small, uh, even within that 5 lakhs or 10 lakh kitty. Maybe you could start off with a lakh or two, with two or three organizations that uh, you want to uh, kind of contribute towards. Uh, work with them for a year or to understand if they are like-minded to your vision and uh, your approach and your line of thinking, and then decide that this is where you would like to contribute towards. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so please write to us if you have any more questions. Uh, meanwhile, would like to ask the next question that comes to mind. Uh, assuming you've gone about um, doing your uh, approach, and you have, I'm sure you'll be flooded with the NGO suggestions. Now, how do you really go about selecting one of those? What criteria do you really use? Right. Short list one that you want to support. Um, so I think this is an important uh, question, Manisha, because um, we have seen and um, you know there's a huge trust deficit in this uh, area itself uh, and that's what actually uh, restricts people to give apart from uh, what's happening so uh, what i would suggest i mean uh, while i list down you know some of the things that uh, we normally suggest to i you know from a criteria perspective and assuming these are all legal kosher ngos uh, but be willing to experiment be willing to fail um, and honestly don't stop your giving because of any bad experience. But having said that, how can you prevent some of these? I think there are three things um, that you should definitely look to, uh, you know, kind of do your diligence on with any organization that you choose to go ahead with. Uh, the first one being the approach. The second one, what I call is effectiveness. And the third one, assessing the efficiency. Uh, when, what I mean by approach is um, essentially uh, when you you know what is the vision understand what the vision of the organization is uh, what is the theory of change you know what is the approach that they are taking to tackle the problem on ground because that will give you a sense of whether this is something that you are actually uh, uh, that is actually aligned with what you believe in should be the approach of the uh, approach to solve that particular problem um, the second aspect from an approach perspective is also understanding who is the driving force behind this organization, right? Uh, who is the founder or the CEO? Who are the board members of this organization? That will give a proxy into who are the, you know, are these credible people who are actually responsible for the actions of this organization? The second part is the effectiveness, uh, you know, which is essentially if you believe that this organization's approach to solving a problem is the right way to go about. Um, what is the outcome? You know, what is what is that ultimately leading to with respect to outcome on the ground? Uh, how are they measuring that outcome? Are they able to, you know, are there indicators uh, that are easily verifiable as well as measurable? And what does the organization use to uh, do that? You know, how does it do that? And whether the outcome itself is sustained in a way, um, right? And, you know, so that tomorrow, if your funding stops, uh, at least you would have impacted that set of beneficiaries whoever those could be and the outcome and hence that's what i mean by the outcome itself is sustained in a way um, the third aspect of uh, diligencing would be uh, efficiency you know uh, you're very clear you know you're aligned with the vision and the approach of the organization to solve the problem you believe that they are truly effective on the ground and have made a considerable impact uh, you know there is clear monitoring in place with respect to verifying those outcomes the third aspect of efficiency is also equally critical as to how effective or efficient this organization is actually uh, in achieving the result on ground. So you have to be, you have to ask for the audited statements and annual reports, understand what the program budget is like, what is their cost of fundraising, and a typical rule of thumb that we have seen is uh, depending, of course, this is talking about from a grassroots organization with organizations working on the ground. 
um, about 10 to 15 percent as cost of fundraising is quite reasonable to uh, kind of go ahead with. And this is something that you need to be cognizant about. There will be overheads because the organization has to function like an organization. So as a donor, also look at, you know, some contributing some percentage with respect to overheads as well. But as long as about 70 to 75 percent is going into the program, uh, that tells you about the efficiency of the organization. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Deepa. Um, so we have a very interesting question from Ujjwal here. Okay. And uh, I think this question must have come to minds of many people. Uh, so the first place to start your philanthropy essentially is your own ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, your support system at home, your servants, your drivers, your maids. Um, so what he wants to know is, is that a better place to start by supporting your health, uh, household help and community that you're engaged with uh, before even thinking about uh, strategy um, and putting a strategy in place right. for your community. Right. Right. Um, so thanks for that question, Ujwal. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, if the charity begins at home, right? So as long as you are able to take care of your uh, uh, ecosystem, which is with respect to the immediate people that you come in association with, uh, you should do that. I think that should be the first step. You're already doing that by employing them, I would say. And uh, you know, as long as you're giving them, care right, of them taking care of their yeah. salaries and all of that, uh, empowering them to take care of their families, that itself is a big start. Um, but having said that, I think which is where the portfolio approach makes sense, where you would always have that. I think you should always take care of your ecosystem, uh, whatever, uh, you know, emergencies that you have within the family and, uh, you know, all people that you know of. And which is where carving out 20 percent of your budget, uh, giving budget uh, towards that will be extremely useful. And that's how you get the most joy and it's most tangible. Um, but if you have a portfolio of, say, about 10 lakhs, then having a more structured approach, and there's no strategy per se to this, it's more structuring your giving in a way uh, would make more sense. No, absolutely, because uh, there is no point in not taking care of the people who are serving you right. uh, before going and um, approaching the other NGOs to help uh, uh, the people. Right. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, so Deepa, uh, we've been working together for the last 10 years and we've worked with very closely with 70 plus individuals and family foundations. Um, so I think it would be interesting to hear from you about uh, maybe two or three people's stories as to how did they go about tackling um, this these same questions and how did they find the causes that they wanted to support. Right, right. Um, so um, so let me just lay it in context, you know, or set the context up front that, uh, uh, yes, we work with about, uh, you know, 70 plus uh, uh, families, individuals, foundations. And honestly, every person's journey is very, very unique. And that's what is the beauty of it, because it's deeply given is deeply personal. And uh, hence, uh, you carve out uh, your own journey for it and you evolve with it. In terms of evolution, which is what I would like to share, are two particular very interesting um, uh, individuals and foundations. Uh, one is an investment uh, banking couple who actually started off saying that uh, we're clueless about giving. Uh, this was about six, seven years ago. Um, and uh, the only thing they knew was they wanted to affect girls, right? And uh, in South Bombay area. So we kind of identified the organizations and they started associating themselves with one particular organization um, even in South Bombay and started giving time, uh, you know, started giving time to not just understand about the organization, but also understanding the space itself, attending various events and forums and all of that. <clears throat> and uh, in the course of that journey, uh, they decided they heard one fantastic uh, speaker and the work that, you know, uh, that the person was doing in Chennai on health mm -hmm. and uh, started engaging with that organization. So much so that today they have set up their own implementing foundation, working, you know, supporting that by their own funds, but also running the show themselves. 
uh, for congenital heart diseases. So here you actually see a shift that, uh, you know, you have started your given time, you started with one cause, but during the course of that journey, you're okay to make shift and eventually you found your true calling in a way. Uh, the second one that um, I would like to cite here is a geography based uh, approach, uh, which is with respect to, um, uh, you know, a person that um, uh, we had started whose route was in Bihar and uh, they were very keen on doing it in Samaskipur uh, district in Bihar, started off with education and wanted to give back. And uh, what they said was that this is uh, something I want to upgrade the school to 12 standard. So we identified a partner organization for them who could help them revive the whole school and uh, actually um, upgrade. So today it was at 8 standard, five years ago, today it goes up to 12. And uh, now they've also taken the approach of saying, okay, there are dropouts from that school at 8 standard, what can we do for them? getting into skilling and also you know setting up a youth resource center for those uh, dropout youths as well as for the girls you know what can be done more to encourage enrollment among girls so I'll pause here yeah. yeah right so we again have an interesting question sure uh, see giving of course is not limited to uh, money and I'm sure that there are people who have such vast experience in their own fields and it is um, definitely the NGO sector also needs to benefit from the skills of such people. Mm -hmm. um, so people, so there is a question that um, uh, people want to give back, not only in terms of money but also in terms of the skills. But on this, on the other hand, uh, the NGOs that they want to work with, they are not very receptive. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, uh, we have a VC uh, listening to us, and he says that he has been giving, but then NGOs are not very receptive. So he finds that it is better to work with social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um so what is your thought on that right right um so so see again it depends on uh, the approach that you're taking to engage with the ngo um what we have seen is um you know as long as you're not pushing your vision on the ngo ngos are typically receptive um uh, so what we would suggest is, of course, social entrepreneurs are always going to be receptive as they begin. Hmm. So that's definitely there and you should continue that. But at the same time, there are NGOs out there. And as long as you put maybe about 5% of your uh, giving budget or of their organization budget on the table, almost always, uh, you know, people do uh, kind of appreciate you giving inputs and do take you seriously. Um, and uh, also what we feel is that as individuals giving a lot of NGOs do listen to individuals as long as it's in line with their uh, vision and it's not defocusing them from their uh, vision itself. In terms of skill set contribution, again, I think time is of criticality because NGOs also struggle a lot mm. with working on the ground. Um, so if you want to engage with the NGO, start volunteering on a sustained basis so as to understand what the challenges are uh, and then you will find them slowly warming up and opening up and being receptive as well. I think that's an excellent suggestion because uh, NGOs, working with NGOs is completely different than working in the corporate sector and the challenges are different. Um, so somebody who is very serious about uh, doing internship or maybe uh, even volunteering with the NGOs, I think it is important for them also to understand the working with the NGO a little bit more and to establish that rapport and I'm sure they'll be more receptive to working with you. Um, so this is great. Uh, so now maybe, uh, do we have any more questions? If not, uh, I would like to a little bit talk about uh, what we uh, do at Pramiti. So Pramiti Philanthropy Partners, uh, we are a philanthropy consulting organization. So we pretty much do what we've been talking about uh, today. So basically uh, helping people um, understand where to give, how to give, which NGOs to give, enabling them to give back to the causes of their choice. Um, to the geography of their choice. So we are completely cause agnostic and we also uh, do a uh, little bit of white papering, a little bit of lands landscape uh, to enable you to understand more about the causes that you are passionate about. Also uh, introducing you to the right kind of people in the sector with who, from whom you can learn beyond the NGOs and um, uh, complete grant management, monitoring, diligencing of the NGOs, project structuring. Uh, 
so whatever it is whatever is required for you to make that right decision and to follow it through uh, so we support philanthropists in each and every stage of their philanthropy journey and um, uh, I would say in the entire process we grow a lot and we get to learn a lot about uh, different sectors um, so that's um, what we do and we'll be very happy to help any of you with your philanthropy journey as well um, so um, unless we have any other questions I think uh, yeah so we are uh, we do have some more time uh, so, uh, so, so maybe, maybe yeah. yeah just summarizing it a little bit uh, for you you know we've addressed a lot more questions and i'm sure there are a lot more uh, but i think i just want to part with um, saying that you know in summary uh, so you, uh, so if I'm getting positive here, sure. there is one more question here okay um so is what is the right amount of money to give the ngo in terms of you know the percentage <laughs> of budget of the ngo or you know uh, are there any other parameters yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so general rule of thumb that we have uh, always followed and which is what we strongly, strongly recommend is uh, never be more than 20% of the organization's budget. Uh, it's very important because tomorrow and, and for both sides, I think, uh, especially with respect to the organizations working on the ground, it is very important that tomorrow, say, if you do um, decide to step back, uh, they have not, you know, kind of their work doesn't come to a standstill. Uh, they have diversified their sources enough uh, so that the work can continue. And they're not and dependent not on completely you know. dependent on you. Yeah. And give them sufficient notice. And by sufficient notice, I would say at least two to three months um, before you say that, uh, you know, you're going to step back or curtail uh, your contributions to the organization. Right. Uh, there is another question by Ashutosh. Uh, he's asking whether MA is something that we also undertake. Who do you want to answer that? Um, so we are we are not an expert on MA. Uh, what we do is we do definitely have some measurement metrics in place, uh, basis the outcomes. So that is something we strongly, strongly believe that, uh, and we are data fanatics to some extent, uh, where we believe that uh, we need to measure uh, the outcomes in whatever simplistic manner. It needs to be measurable and verifiable, and it has to tie back to the overall objective. So our monitoring and evaluation is uh, more around monitoring rather than measurement and evaluation. Right. Um, another very interesting question. Is it better to go a gift to the organization's um, expenses or program expenses? <laughs> so. uh, <laughs> okay, um, so I would say um, both. Uh, as you start off with, you should consider both. Um, you definitely, you know, people evolve and uh, see, people need to run organizations. So I think you should do both organization expenses as well as programmatic expenses. You could perhaps limit the percentage of the organization expenses to maybe about 20% uh, of the overall thing to as you start. But what is very important is if you are happy with the performance of the organization, you believe that these people are truly making a difference on the ground, um, you're like-minded uh, you know, with the founder or the board, our strong suggestion would be to actually make that 100% of organization support if you can and because one goes forward, one, yeah. as one goes forward because a lot of organizations struggle to raise money for their own institution capacities. Right. And um, I would just like to add that with the CSR coming into uh, play now, um, most of the organizations do find uh, donors for their programs. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, their own expenditure is something that they struggle with. Correct. So, correct. And I believe there is a question here, if I'm reading it correct, it's saying what is the right of amount of money to give to an NGO as percent of their you budget? You already answered that. Uh, so that they're meaningful, meaningful as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, I think any amount is meaningful to the organization. But if you want to truly give inputs and want your inputs to be seriously received by the organization, um, then what we have seen is 5% of the organization budget as an individual is quite meaningful uh, mm. to the organizations. Mm. Right. And um, the question about whether it should be CAPEX versus OPEX. I mean, whether you should be building structures or whether you should be supporting the existing structures. Um, here again, it's very it's a very personal thing. Uh, if you believe that you want to leave a legacy behind, 
uh, in the form of structures um, than you could. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know, there is uh, no dearth of infrastructure in our country, honestly, uh, at least in the in the urban areas. If you're thinking about something in the rural, then you could consider giving for capital and then also ongoing operational expenditure. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's personal. I think it would be capex and opex. But see if you are able to contribute. If there is an existing infrastructure itself, rather than building something new altogether, there's existing infrastructure that could be renovated or refurbished and reused, uh, rather than building a new one. I would say it largely depends on the need of the geography as well Correct. and the cause that you're supporting. So there is yeah. no right or wrong, or wrong answer to this yes. question in a way. Right. Um, Right, so you want to sum up? <laughs> okay, um, so in, uh, I think we've spoken a lot uh, and we're running out of time now. Um, just wanted to share in terms of imparting words in uh, summary, uh, what we would say is start, right? I think getting started is the, the most absolute thing, uh, yeah. critical thing. Start with one or two causes that uh, closely resonate with you. Uh, identify the organizations, uh, you know, in the way that we shared with respect to Googling uh, platforms using various other platforms such as uh, GuideStar India, Give India, Credibility Alliance, or asking your friends or calling up your friends, um, or, you know, piggybacking on some of the larger foundations that are already doing a fantastic job for you. Uh, create a simple Excel sheet, more than enough, will do the trick. Make sure you review it once in six months as to what's happening. Uh, spend some time, go meet organizations on ground, uh, go to the program site, you know, where the program execution is actually taking place. Um, there's no greater joy than actually seeing, uh, you know, what's happening on ground with your money and come back and revisit what uh, you want to do. And most importantly, be willing to experiment as you start. Uh, you will fail, uh, but you will learn in the process and evolve in the process. Absolutely. And uh, just one word from me is you should enjoy in the entire process. So ultimately, uh, giving does not really make sense if you don't enjoy the whole process and the outcome of giving. Um, so thanks a lot, Deepa, and thanks all of you for joining us today. Uh, I hope you've had um, you've enjoyed the conversation, and don't forget to uh, like the giving my promise, the living my promise page. Uh, thank you. So thank much. you so much. Yeah. <laughs>